ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا amma ba'd my dear brothers and sisters i would like to dedicate this talk to every individual who was abandoned by their father i would like to dedicate this talk to every individual who has loved someone in this world yet for one reason or another was left abandoned i would love i would like to dedicate this talk to every individual who has lost someone to death and they couldn't figure out why the talk is called he who has no one has allah and i want you to imagine the following situation you're 7 years old and you come from a family that isn't well off you have many brothers and sisters and your own parents cannot afford to keep you in the house So they say go and live with your uncle who is going to take care of you. This uncle of yours, he runs a madrasa for young children. He teaches them tahfiz of the Quran. He's known to be a good and righteous man. You go and live with this uncle and you he treats you like one of his own children. He loves you and takes care of you. One day while you're finished the tahfiz class, you're sitting in your room. He comes into the room and he gives you a hug and that is how it all begins. The next day he comes and he touches you somewhere else and it becomes more inappropriate but you're a young child. You don't know what to feel, you don't know what to do, but you know that something is wrong. For 4 years this continues and in fact it actually gets much much worse. and excuse me for not using the term but please understand what i'm trying to say things get much much worse finally when you reach the age of 11 you decide that you can't live like this anymore you need to tell someone you need to speak out you go to your parents when you go to visit them you go to your brothers and sisters your own blood relatives you tell them what's going on and they say you just have a personal agenda against your uncle Your uncle runs a tahfiz school. He is the imam of the masjid. He's known to be righteous. You just have a personal problem. And they just absolutely ignore everything you have to say. This individual grows up and cannot have a stable relationship. Every relationship they try to have is sabotaged by the lack of trust they can have in any individual. This individual Now let's bring it to reality is a sister. She wears niqab not because she believes it's a religious obligation but because she believes this is the only way she can live in the world where she can hide her face and no one can truly know who she is. This sister at the age of 11 tried to commit suicide. She cut her own wrists. Yet Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow her to die. This sister at the age of 19 took an overdose of pills. Again, she was taken to the hospital and Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow her to die. And she tried it again, one last time, the third time, saying that perhaps this will be the time where her pain will go away. That was all she wanted. She wanted the pain to be taken away, and that is why she sought out death. She tried to commit suicide one more time. And again Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala saved her once more. She finally decided to get some help and she contacted me. And I thought at my I thought to myself at that time how do you take away this individual's pain? What could I possibly do that I would be able to help this individual? This story became a journey for myself. And as I tried to help this sister, I realized that this wasn't just an individual case. There are people across this world who are living in pain and agony. Different types of pain, different types of agony. 
But it always comes down to the same conclusion, that shaitan, somehow or another, finds a way to get the better of them and derails them from the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this lecture is dedicated to all of those individuals. I want to start off this lecture by explaining the reality of this world. We live in this world with all of the luxuries, with all of the comforts, and we think that this is what the world is meant to be like. But we fail to realize that even in luxury, even in blessing, this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even luxury and blessing is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what it all comes down to. That this life is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ أَلَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّن رَّبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُحْتَدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in these beautiful verses, Surely we shall test each and every single one of you with a loss of wealth, with a loss of life, with a loss of profit and trade. So give glad tidings to those who are patient. Those, when they are tested, they say to Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. Upon those people are the blessings and prayers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, those are the ones who are truly guided. Now this lecture started off on a very heavy note. And I know it's very burdensome to feel someone else's pain, so I want to lighten the scene for a little bit. I like to do a small test, and this test is to see how you react to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this test is called the driving test. The driving test is as follows. I want you to imagine you're a driver in the car, you're all by yourself. You've parallel parked your car, and you're reversing out. So everyone, get with me right now, inshallah. You get into your car, you're in the driver's seat. You put your seatbelt on. You look into the rear view mirror, and there's nothing there. You look into the passenger side mirror, and there's nothing there. You put your foot on the clutch, you put it in reverse, and you're slowly, slowly, slowly backing out. Boom! You just hit something. What was the first word that came to your mouth? <laughs> For a lot of people, it's a four-letter word that they wouldn't say in front of their parents. But the reality of this situation is, imagine if you died on that word. Imagine if you died on that word. It was a truck, it came and hit you, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to take you away at that time. That was the word that you would have died upon. And this is how you see how you react to the qadr of Allah. This is just a make-believe test that we're doing in the masjid. Far from reality. But it happens. People cross the street every day, they get hit by a car. People are driving, they get hit by trucks. People go to sleep at night and they just pass away. So you always want to pay attention very closely to what the last action that you do is. If you have the ability to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is what you want to strive for. So that was the test. How do you react to the qadr of Allah? You now know where you stand. Number two, when talking about tests and trials from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Trials and tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not just the calamities that strike us in terms of death, in terms of loss of wealth. But they're also blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that we don't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And we don't use them in their appropriate means. So this whole talk is about changing perspective. Having the right frame of mind and understanding what is truly going on in your life. If you are not being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you do not see that test then now is the time to realize that you're either being tested by pain or you're being tested by pleasure. They both need the exact same result. You turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who is being tested by pain, he seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help and finds a recourse out. The one who is being tested by pleasure, he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those blessings and he uses those blessings to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Point number three. When it comes to tests and trials from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have one of two choices. Particularly when it comes to calamity, particularly when it comes to pain. You can either deal with the pain right now, 
and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you can delay dealing with the pain, seeking the pity of others, seeking help from others, and prolonging the pain without any recourse. And it's very important to understand the cycles that individuals go through when they go through pain. When they lose someone that they love, when they feel betrayed by an other individual, the very first reaction they have is to isolate themselves. They want to be alone. Now this is more significant when it comes to men. Because men natu naturally like to deal with their own pain. They don't like to speak about it. Women naturally like to speak about their pain and suffering. And that's why their first reaction is going on the phone, going to see their mothers, going to see their friends. However, when it comes to true pain, at one time or another, you will try to isolate yourself. And this is the first thing you need to recognize, that this is not what you want to do. This is not a natural reaction, but rather it is shaitan telling you that you will feel better when you're alone. Because you're the only one that understands what you're going through. It is a deception from shaitan. So while you may need to be alone for a little while, prolonged isolation is very harmful and detrimental to your situation. What you want to do at that time is that short period of time, once you've gotten over that initial rage, that initial pain, then after that you need to get around the believers. You need to get around people who are going to remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to share a nice story from the students of Shaykh Ibn Baz rahimahullah ta'ala. And this brings us to our fourth point. That fourth point is, it's not about how you live your life in this world. It's not about how you live your life in this world, but it's all about how you will be raised in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is all about how you will be raised. And this alludes us to the point that whatever you die upon is what you shall be raised upon. So let your last deed be your best one. And the story goes as follows. There was a brother who came overseas. And he came to seek a bachelor's degree in any field. And the natural climate was that this was the first time he got freedom from his family. In his society, people are very religious, very practicing. He couldn't have the fun that he wanted to have. So he comes to a place like England. He's in a free mixing university. In a society where no girl looks at you. In fact, there are no girls in your class. Now all of a sudden, they're sitting next to you. And you can actually find an excuse to talk to them. Hey, can I borrow a pen? Hey, can I borrow some paper? And conversation becomes very easy. And now that you have a foreign accent, oh my God, you're a fitna for them. And this was the reality that he went through. That he came from a foreign land, and this attraction hit him right away. The initial stages were that he'd just go out for lunch, he'd just go out for meetings, and that is how life continued. He never actually committed zina. One day though, he went to a party, and he committed zina. Out of, you know, pure emotion. He committed zina, and when he was done, he just lay there thinking, I have just ruined myself. And he didn't know what to do. He didn't know where to go. He didn't have any close friends that could guide him. He knew that the only place that this guidance that he had known was back in his hometown. He booked a ticket back to Saudi Arabia where he was from. And on his way, he had a stopover in the city, in the country of Qatar. While he's in Qatar, he goes to the musallah, and he's just crying. And you'll see that this is one of the least, most awkward situations that you'll have. You can think about when you're with people and there's this awkward silence. And it's really weird. What do you do in that situation? What becomes even more awkward is when you see a grown man crying like a baby. He's crying like a baby. What do you do in that situation? One of the students of Shaykh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, he saw this man. And he goes up to this man and says, Oh man, why are you crying? What's wrong? And he explains to him the situation that I committed zina and I've destroyed myself. And the only way I can get rid of this pain is if I go back and have the hudud implemented on me. This is the only way I will be purified. The student calms the man down and he says, Look, don't do anything rash. Let's go back to Riyadh together and we'll deal with the situation. They head back to Riyadh and the man is still crying throughout the whole journey. He feels really bad for what he has done. The student says, look, we've arrived in Riyadh. Go spend the night at home. I will call you in the morning. Just make sure you don't do anything. Don't do anything. Just wait till I call you. The next morning, the student calls Sheikh bin Baz. And he asks Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, ya Sheikh, you know, this is what happened. I met this man. He committed zina. 
and he feels that the only way he can be purified is if he has the hudud implemented on him. Sheikh bin Baz says, tell this man not to turn himself in, but rather the sin has been hidden from the people, continue to hide it. Rather, seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn yourself to the Qur'an. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be your guide. So this is what the Shaykh says to the student. The student calls this man up. Let's give him a name now. His name was Ahmed. He tells Ahmed, look, the Shaykh says, don't turn yourself in. Death is the easy way out. This pain and suffering will not be taken away from that act. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want this from you. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to rectify your ways, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is when that pain and suffering will be taken away. That is what Ahmad decides to do. A couple of days go by, he starts reading the Quran, he starts praying in the masjid, and he says that I've never missed a single salah in the masjid since that event took place. This continues for about two weeks. Now this student, he disappeared from the life of Ahmad. There was no contact between him. And then one day, he notices that he has a missed call from Ahmad. He says, later on, I'll give him a call. Another couple of days go by, and Ahmad's house is calling now. His home number is showing up on the sheikh's phone five, six times. The student calls the house back, and he says, Assalamu alaikum, how are you guys doing? What's going on? And they say, we need to speak to you. Ahmad needs your help. And he says, definitely, I'll come over and see you tonight after Isha. He prays Isha, heads over to the house. And he sees that something just isn't right. That you can walk into a place, no one will say anything, but you can see it from their faces. You can see it from their sights that something just isn't right. He goes to the father and he says, Salaamu Alaikum. He says, Wa Alaikum as -salam. He says, I don't even know what to say to you, but I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because I know if it hadn't been for you, this wouldn't have happened. And the student's thinking, what did I do? So he says, you know, well, what happened? What are you talking about? And he says, let me show you. He says, Ahmed went and prayed Salat al-Isha tonight. And he came back and he came to pray his sunnahs. And he was in his room for a really, really long time. And we went to seek him out. We didn't know what had happened to him. But I want to show you. He took the student to Ahmad's room, and there Ahmad was in sajda. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his life away at that time. And that is how he passed away. This is the story of an individual, not who was righteous, but this man committed zina, one of the biggest sins in Islam. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his life away. And inshallah, when he's resurrected, that's the deed he's going to be resurrected on, making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why when it comes to pain and suffering, pain and suffering only becomes negative if it creates a barrier between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it becomes positive. Pain becomes positive, a motivation for you when it brings you back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what every individual who's going through pain and suffering needs to realize. That this point of pain and suffering is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish you, but rather this is a calling from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh my slave, Come back to your Lord. Oh my slave, this is a reminder for you that I want to bring you back to me. And this is one of the wisdoms of trials and tribulations. That while we call each other on the phone, while we text message each other, the calling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes through trials and tribulations. And you can react one of two ways. Either you can deal with the pain at that moment and decide to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you can decide to just... Restrict that pain to yourself, not do anything about it, and then you'll see what it does to your deen. And this is the last stage of the cycle of isolation, that once you're isolated, you'll see that eventually your deen starts to disappear. The content of your salah, the khushu in your salah, it disappears. Your ability to recite the Qur'an is no longer there. Your ability to fast during the day, it gets taken away. What did you do differently? What you did differently was you gave yourself into shaitan. And shaitan's promise is that he will lead you astray. He will lead you away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in times of trials and tribulation, you need to seek out the believers. You need to seek out the righteous and let them be your guide and help to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Point number five. 
is that there is actually a blessing inside trials that we don't perceive. The simplest trial that an individual will go through is that he's walking on the road and he gets pricked by a thorn. He gets pricked by something that goes through his skin and causes him to say, ouch. But it's only for a split second. The Prophet ﷺ said that no individual is pricked by a thorn except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies him with a sin for it. Now imagine an individual who loses someone that he loves. What was the promise of the Messenger of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ was once giving his halaqa to women. He was giving a reminder to the sisters. And he said to the sisters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not take away three children from a woman except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that sister paradise if she is patient. Now you can imagine there's a sister in the audience. She didn't lose three children. She only lost two. She says, Ya Rasulullah, how about a woman who has lost two children? The Prophet ﷺ knew her situation and he said, uh, I can't remember her name, but he said, Oh sister, even an individual who has lost two children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will promise that individual paradise. Trials and tribulations are a means of purification. They are a means of purifying you so you can go to the purest of places. The punishment of Allah is not out of anger and wrath. The punishment of Allah is a means of cleansing you of your sins. The punishment of Allah is a preparation that you can go into noblest and purest of places. Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends trials and tribulations. Point number six is that in this world, you will never truly be happy. No matter what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, you will never truly be content. You can have the most amount of money in the world, you can have the biggest house, you can have the most beautiful spouse, you can have everything that you desire, and you'll never be happy. True contentment, true contentness and satisfaction comes in the akhirah alone. It comes when we are in paradise. All of this is about perspective and how you deal with the situation. And that is why it is very important that an individual who goes through trial, he changes his perspective of the trial. It's not a punishment from Allah, it's a means to get closer. It is not a punishment from Allah, it's a calling from Allah that He wants you to come back to Him. Now I want to end off with two more points, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not burden a soul more than it can bear. A lot of the times when we go through trials and tribulations, it feels that this trial is so great that there's no one being persecuted more than us at that given moment. But the reality of the situation is, that is not the case. There is always someone who is in a worse predicament than you. One simple statistic shows that. Any individual that lives in the West, any individual that lives in the West, is automatically in the 5% elite of the world. 5% elite of the world. That means 95% of the people are worse off than you. They live off less than a dollar a day. They drink water that is brown. They drink water that is mixed with mud and feces and bacteria and everything else. They make, food, they make shoes out of water bottles. They make shoes out of water bottles just so that they can walk. So the reality is that there's always someone who's being, who's being tried and tested more than you. And this is why I remember one, one of the last halaqas I attended in Medina was perhaps one of the most beautiful. And if you were to ask me, you know, what we were studying, I can tell you we were studying the Muwatta of Imam Malik. But if you were to ask me what we learned, I can tell you that I only learned one thing from that halaqa, and that's what I want to share with you right now. The statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, the statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, where he said, when we were tested, we were grateful for three things. We used to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the time of calamity for three things. Number one, that this trial wasn't in our deen. That this trial wasn't in our deen. Number two, that this trial was not as great as it could have been. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made this trial much, much worse. You lost one parent. Imagine those individuals who had lost both. You lost one loved one. Imagine an individual who lost his wife and his children. 
And this is perhaps one of the, I guess, painful experiences I've ever, ever experienced, and it wasn't even my situation. There was a friend, a, a brother to me, who I studied with in the University of Medina. He got married, and this was like his lifelong mission. He was a convert, and it was extremely difficult for him to get married. He would go from house to house, propose to sister to sister. The father would see his skin color and say, sorry, you know, you don't have enough money, or your family isn't good enough. Or they would actually straight, say straight out, I'm sorry, but you're black, and my, sister, and my daughter isn't. And he would be rejected. The day that he got married was one of the most beautiful experiences for him because that's what he was striving for, that he was chaste and he protected that chastity and that's what he wanted. Then imagine the day his wife finally becomes pregnant. His wife becomes pregnant and they're joyous together now that they're about to give birth to a beautiful baby. Nine months pass by, the sister is taken to the hospital. The brother says to his neighbor, look, take her to the hospital. I need to sort some stuff else in the house, and I'll, take, and I'll meet you guys in the hospital. The sister, the pregnant sister, goes to the hospital, and this brother packs up the stuff that the sister will need in the hospital, and he heads to the hospital. He gets to the hospital. Both his wife and his child have passed away. And you can imagine the pain and agony that he goes through. Now put that in perspective to anything that you may have lost in this world. Imagine the time that, you know, there were 10 pounds in your pocket, you don't know where it went, and it was such a painful experience to you. Put it in perspective with this situation. He didn't know he was about to lose his wife and child. He went to the hospital and they had passed away. This was such a, a difficult trial, and it wasn't even mine, it was, you know, for a brother of mine. So put things in perspective that the trial can always be greater. And number three, he says that we were grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to be patient in that trial. Allowed us to be patient in that trial. Now why is patience such an important thing when it comes to trial? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that an individual who is patient in times of adversity incurs the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the individual who is not patient, he incurs the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the situation is already as difficult as it is. You're going through a trial. Why make it worse by not being patient? Because you're only incurring the wrath of Allah. And an individual who's patient and remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they get the salawat of Allah, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. They get the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends off the verse by saying, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُحْتَدُونَ That they are the ones who are truly guided. I want to end off my talk with a hadith that will put everything else in perspective in Allah Ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِذَا أَصَابَ أَحَدُكُمْ بِمُصِيبَةٍ فَلْيَذْكُرْ مُصِيبَتُهُ بِي فَإِنَّهَا أَعْظَمَ الْمَصَائِبِ That if any of you is ever tried by a tribulation, then let him remember his trial and tribulation through my calamity. For indeed, it is the greatest of trials. What is happening here, the Prophet ﷺ is alluding to the death of the Prophet ﷺ. It is the greatest trial that every Muslim goes through without even realizing it. And let's look at why. You look at the status of the Prophet ﷺ, he was every man's best friend. You see this in two particular ways. Number one, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Where he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu and he says, Ya Rasulullah, who is the most beloved person to you? The Prophet Sallallahu responds, Aisha. And he thinks to himself, okay, that's not the answer I'm looking for. How do I get the answer I'm looking for? He wants to hear his own name. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, not from the women, but from the men. Then he says, her father. And he says, hmm, that makes sense. You know, they are best friends at the end of the day. Khalas, I have to be next. So he says, then who Ya Rasulullah? He then says, Umar. Okay, it's still not him. He says, then who, Ya Rasulullah, Uthman. And then he gives up at that point. The point of this hadith is that every man thought he was the best friend of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So each individual lost their best friend. Number two, the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was every individual's consoler. One of the greatest concerns every individual should have is what is going to be the destination of my father. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah. He came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, my father died upon disbelief. 
Is he going to be in the hellfire? The Prophet ﷺ simply at this time could have said, yes, he's going to be in the hellfire, and you know what? That's too bad for you. He could have said that. But he knew the pain that he was feeling, and he wanted him to feel good. So he said, both your father and my father are in the same destination. He consoled that man. So people lost their best friends. People lost their consolers. The wives of the Prophet lost their husband. The Muslim community lost their leader. The old women in the community who had no one to tell their problems to, they used to tell it to the Messenger of Allah. They lost the ones who would hear them out. Now imagine the greatest of all trials. The Prophet ﷺ was our direct link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ was our direct link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when this ummah did something wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal down through the Prophet ﷺ, this is what you should be doing. They did something right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the ummah about the rewards of paradise so that they continue to do it. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, all of that was taken away. Now put it into further perspective. When leadership was taken away, who is going to step up to fill the shoes of the Prophet ﷺ? The ummah was left without a leader. And it would have been absolute chaos had one man not step up to the plate. Had one man not step up to the plate, Abu Bakr an and decide to take that leadership, decide to put things in his own hands, decide to remind the ummah, Man kana ya'budullah, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa inna Muhammadan qad mat, wa man kana ya'budullah fa inna Allah hayyun la yamut. That whoever used to worship Muhammad, know that Muhammad has passed away. But whoever worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then know that Allah is ever living and does not die. Reconnecting the people with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to end this lecture off with a funny note again. When I think about this situation, I mean, imagine you're a companion at that time. Someone needs to step up and take leadership. But you know, taking this leadership is not the leadership where it just comes with fame and riches and all of that. But rather it comes with responsibility that you have to deal with everyone's problems. You have to be the religious authority of that community. It's a very great situation. How am I going to tie this in for you? Optimus Prime. If you guys have ever heard of Transformers, <laughs> I came across this line, and this is one to, what I want to end up upon, what I want to end off the lecture upon, is that there's a, this famous line of Optimus Prime. You think it was like a statement of a Sahabi, you think it was the statement of one of the great Imams of the Salaf, but it's just Optimus Prime. And where's the Dulkanin? Is he here? There he is. He loves this statement. And that was the statement, fate rarely calls upon the people at a time of their choosing. Fate rarely calls upon the people at a time of their choosing. In times of trials and tribulation, you have a decision to make. Either you can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is your way to paradise. Or you can decide to live with your pain, seek the pity of people, and let the pain get worse, and create your own destruction. Now this lecture started off with, He who has no one has Allah but I want you to leave with the opposite of this statement, that he who has Allah has everything. Jazakumullahu khair, wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa barik ala nabiyyana Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviates the pain of every believer and of every Muslim, and that he makes it a path to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather than a path that leads away from him. جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته